Hi, I'm Susie Quattro. I hope you're all going to enjoy my documentary, Susie Q, it's warts and all. Long before the Runaways and the Go-Go's, Susie Quattro was forging new territory for women in rock. With her trademark black leather jumpsuit and bass guitar in hand, Quattro's 1970s anthems like Can the Can and Devilgate Drive captured the rebellious spirit of the era. As Leather Tuscadero on Happy Days, she brought that rebel image to American TV screens. Now in her 70s, she still energetically tours the world, cementing her legacy as a pioneering force for women in music. Join us as we show you what happened to the star of Happy Days, Susie Quattro. Musical Upbringing in Detroit In the heart of Detroit, a city pulsating with musical energy, Susie Quattro, born Susan K. Quattro on June 3, 1950, was destined for a life intertwined with melody and rhythm. Her family tree was rich with musical talent, with her father, Art Quattro, a jazz musician who moonlighted at General Motors by day and chased the magic of music by night, jamming with various trios around Detroit. Her mother, Helen, hailing from Hungary, brought a touch of international flair to the mix, having met Art during one of his jazz band's European tours. Surrounded by instruments at home, Susie and her siblings were naturally drawn to music from an early age. At just six years old, Susie was profoundly inspired after seeing Elvis Presley perform on television. The raw energy and showmanship of the king made a lasting impression. Soon after, around age seven or eight depending on sources, Susie began sitting in with her father's jazz trio, playing bongos and percussion on stage. This marked her first foray into live performance and nurtured her comfort in front of an audience. Throughout her childhood, Susie's parents also fostered several other children temporarily, exposing her to diversity and new perspectives. Being the fourth of five children with three older sisters and one younger brother, Susie had a bustling upbringing always surrounded by music and mayhem. Her brother Michael Quattro would also pursue music professionally like his big sister. With access to numerous instruments at home, Susie taught herself how to play bass guitar and keyboards. Her innate talent was evident early on. By age 11, Susie was already performing on local Detroit television as a go-go dancer on a music variety series. The sounds of Motown and its funky beats served as the soundtrack for her childhood. She grew up near the epicenter of the Motown explosion, which was cultivating future legends like the Supremes, Stevie Wonder, Marvin Gaye, and The Temptations. Susie absorbed these soulful, empowering influences, which informed her musical style later on. Though immersed in American R&B, Susie has cited British invasion bands like The Beatles and The Rolling Stones as major inspirations growing up. Seeing The Beatles on The Ed Sullivan Show in February 1964 was a seminal moment for her. The Beatlemania craze that ensued opened Susie's eyes to the tremendous power of rock and roll music. Little did she know then that she would become a pioneer in that male-dominated genre a decade later. The Pleasure Seekers in 1964, when Susie was just 14 years old, her older sister Patty started an all-female garage rock band called The Pleasure Seekers, with two friends in their neighborhood. This was during the height of the British invasion spearheaded by the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. Inspired by their idols, Patty saw an opportunity for an all-girl rock group to make waves. One month after forming in June 1964, Susie joined the band on bass guitar and as a lead vocalist, adopting the stage name Susie Soul. Patty went by Patty Pleasure. As the Pleasure Seekers, the Quattro sisters and their bandmates quickly made a name for themselves around the burgeoning Detroit music scene. They started off playing local gigs and talent shows, gaining notoriety for their edgy rock sound and bold stage presence as an all-female group. By 1965, they were performing in popular Michigan nightclubs on a regular basis. In the spring of 1966, the band dynamic expanded again when Susie and Patty's older sister Arlene joined on keyboards. Arlene's husband Leo Fenn also came on board to manage the group. With Leo handling the business side, the Pleasure Seekers' focus remained on honing their raw, energetic stage show. As teens, the Quattro sisters had to put up with chauvinism and skepticism of their abilities early on. But through tenacity and undeniable talent, they persevered. 
their local profile continued growing rapidly. In 1967, the Pleasure Seekers made television appearances in Detroit and even opened for major acts like Alice Cooper and Chuck Berry when they came through town. Opening for the legendary Chuck Berry at the Rooster Tail Club was a milestone, though Susie has recalled her father punching Berry for getting inappropriate with her sister Patty backstage. By 1968, they had graduated to touring regionally and even booked some short tours overseas. They became seasoned road warriors out of necessity, traveling long distances in cramped vans to put on their exhilarating live shows for appreciative audiences. After signing a record deal with Mercury Records in 1968, they began releasing singles and appearing on compilation albums spotlighting the Detroit music scene. From the cabarets to the recording studio, the Pleasure Seekers' dedication was unwavering. Evolution marked the band's journey as well. In 1969, they changed their name to Cradle, releasing a single under their new moniker. Personnel fluctuated too. Arlene left the group that year while the youngest Quattro sister Nancy joined for the first time. Through all the turbulence, Susie remained the anchor and front woman for nearly seven years, from ages 14 to 21. Formative times on her path to stardom. She cut her teeth during the incredible ride with her sister's brainchild, the Pleasure Seekers. Big move to Britain. Hi, I'm Susie Quattro. I hope you're all going to enjoy my documentary, Susie Q, it's warts and all. By October 1971, Susie Quattro decided it was time to venture out on her own. The roller coaster ride with her sister's band had run its course. Musically and personally, Susie felt a desire to explore new directions and a solo career beyond Detroit. Serendipitously, an opportunity arose that paved her way to international stardom. Earlier that year in 1971, English record producer Mickey Most, owner of Rack Records, caught Susie performing live with her band Cradle. Most immediately saw star potential in the commanding frontwoman singing and playing bass. At the time, he had been scouting for a talented female rock artist to mentor and propel to fame. Most, who had already produced hits for The Animals and Jeff Beck Group, knew Susie had the complete package. Through Susie's brother Michael's persistence, Most agreed to witness Susie's talent in person during Cradle's British tour that summer. Thoroughly impressed, Most convinced the young rocker to sign with Rack Records and move to London to begin solo work. For Susie, this meant leaving her family and hometown of Detroit behind. But the opportunity was too promising to pass up. In October 1971, Susie made the life-changing move across the pond. She immersed herself in London's thriving music scene. Most connected her with songwriter Peter William Hamm, who had penned hits for British pop star Cliff Richard. After auditioning backing bands, Susie assembled a group of skilled British musicians to support her recordings and live shows. She quickly built up her profile, touring the UK as the supporting opening act for rock band Thin Lizzy in 1972. This gave her valuable exposure in front of large crowds. Though initial singles failed to gain traction in most countries, the 1972's Rolling Stone became an unexpected hit in Portugal, shooting to number one on the charts there. This early success in Portugal gave Susie's career some initial momentum. Can the can can't be stopped? The year 1973 marked Susie Quattro's major breakthrough as a solo star, thanks to her smash hit, Can the Can. But let's have a look at her. On Top of the Pops, the song is Can the Can, and it's 1973. The song was penned by British hitmakers Mike Chapman and Nicky Chin, whom producer Mickey Most had brilliantly paired her up with. As soon as Susie heard their composition, she knew it was going to be big. The nonsensical lyrics, crunchy guitar riff, and high-energy percussion perfectly aligned with the brash rock sound she wanted to create. When Can the Can was released as a single in May 1973, it became an overnight sensation. The track shot straight to number one on the UK charts in July and even reached number one in countries like Australia, Spain, and South Africa. Back home in America, it managed to climb to a modest number 56, but the song's worldwide success solidified Susie as an unstoppable force in music. The accompanying album, Susie Quattro, also performed well, making it to number 32. Bolstered by this triumph, Susie wasted no time keeping her hot streak going. She tapped Chapman and Chin for more smash singles to satisfy the public's demand. They delivered the number UK hit, Devil Gate Drive, in 1974, which Susie memorably performed on top of the pops, clad in her signature black leather jumpsuit and bass guitar. 1974 also saw the release of her second LP, Quattro, which contained songs like Daytona Demon and her first UK top 10 track, 
48 crash. Touring played a pivotal role during Susie's 70s heyday too. In late 1973, she supported glam rockers Slade on their UK tour. This garnered her exposure in front of huge audiences primed for high-energy rock. It was a mutually beneficial pairing, as Susie could utilize Slade's new PA system without charge. She wowed the crowds as an opening act throughout the tour. International success continued for Susie in 1974 with a tour across Japan. She became the very first female rock singer to perform a headline concert tour of Japan's major cities. Her popularity was skyrocketing across continents. Next came Australia in 1976 for hugely attended shows that reinforced her stardom down under. Through extensive touring from 1973 to 1976, Susie Quattro had grown from a Detroit novice to an unstoppable global phenomenon. Beyond the musical hits Happy Days by the late 1970s, Susie Quattro sought new creative challenges outside her extraordinary music career. This led her to explorations in television acting roles, theatrical performance, and evolving her sound. Her ventures into acting memorably included playing the character Leather Tuscadero across seven episodes of the popular American sitcom Happy Days. Are you crazy? Not rich. I'll handle this. Are you crazy? <laughs> from 1977 to 1979. The idea originated when Happy Days producer Gary Marshall offered Susie the role without an audition after seeing her photo in his daughter's room. Susie portrayed Leather as a cool, leather-jacketed rocker and younger sister to Fonzie's past flame, Pinky Tuscadero. She made such an impression that Marshall asked her to headline a Leather Tuscadero spin-off series, but Susie declined, preferring to prioritize her musical passions. The Happy Days appearances introduced Susie to American Households Weekly, helping build her profile in the often elusive U.S. market. In 1979, she spread her acting wings further by starring in a BBC TV play called Pleasure Cove. Susie played a singer whose glamorous pop career dissolved, forcing her to return home. Her own music featured prominently on the show's soundtrack. On stage, Susie pursued lead roles in musicals like a 1986 West End production of Annie Get Your Gun, portraying the spunky Annie Oakley. Her spirited acting and stellar singing voice were lauded, despite being a bold choice for the role. She returned to the stage in 1991, this time devising her own one-woman show about 1920s icon Tallulah Bankhead titled Tallulah Who, which ran for a month in England. Regarding her musical evolution, Susie began incorporating more pop, new wave, and adult contemporary influences into her work in the late 70s and 80s. 1978 brought one of her biggest U.S. hits via a duet with Smokey's Chris Norman called Stumblin' In. The softer sound marked a maturity in her approach. Parental-themed tunes like 1981's Mama's Boy also showcased versatility. Experimentation flowed through albums like 1979's Susie and Other Four Letter Words, which contained the synth-heavy She's In Love With You. Disco funk permeated her sound on tracks like 1982's Tonight I Could Fall In Love. Throughout the era, Susie proved she could transcend her rock roots without sacrificing integrity. However, this sonic shape-shifting did not always translate to maintaining chart success. But Susie followed her artistic muse rather than chasing fleeting commercial rewards. Leather, Licks, and Legacy Aside from catchy songs, Susie Quattro's groundbreaking musical legacy stems from her subversion of female stereotypes in rock through a bold style and masterful bass guitar skills. She rejected stifling femininity and expectations to present a strong, empowered, leather-clad rock goddess image paired with tough bass lines. When Susie was first promoting her 1973 smash Can the Can, she insisted on wearing her signature black leather jumpsuit look for photo shoots. This drew pushback from her record label who thought she should have a softer, more pop star image. But Susie would not compromise her rocker authenticity and won out, establishing her now iconic, leather-centric aesthetic. In many ways, Susie's choice of clothing channeled female strength and echoed her hero Elvis Presley's leather outfits. She has also cited the sci-fi film Barbarella as an inspiration for her daring stage fashion. Along with the leather jumpsuits, Susie often sported a shag mullet hairstyle and dark eye makeup on stage and album covers. This created a look that screamed rebellion and rejected conventional standards of so-called appropriate femininity. Susie's status as a fierce frontwoman playing bass also broke ground. She has been deemed the first female bass guitarist to achieve international fame in the male-dominated world of rock music as a bass player and vocalist. Her bass chops were evident on funky lines in songs like 
Can the Can, and held down rhythms tightly in concert with her bands. She could effortlessly switch between playing intricate parts and belting out vocals, a unique double-duty skill set. In the male-dominated realm of rock, Susie's domineering stage presence and bass-playing ability sent a bold message. Her success proved women could rock just as hard as men. She inspired legions of girls so that they too could pick up a bass and rock out without conforming to stifling gender roles. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame recognized Susie's pioneering impact when they featured her iconic jumpsuit and bass in a 2018 exhibit about rock fashion. Her influence extends to many prominent female musicians who cite seeing Susie's command of the stage as motivation. Artists like The Runaways Joan Jett and Talking Heads Tina Weymouth specifically credit her as a role model. Susie Quattro's groundbreaking style and musical skills didn't just break the mold, they shattered it. She made the male-centric rock genre more inclusive and welcoming to female performers by blazing her own trail on her own terms. That leather-clad legacy still resonates today. Love, life, and loss. Though Susie Quattro faced immense professional success starting in 1973, her personal life behind the scenes experienced its share of love, struggles, and losses. In 1976, she married her guitarist Len Tucky, with whom she had two children and shared over 15 years before divorcing in 1992. Len had been a collaborator since Susie's early days in England, playing guitar on hits like Can the Can. Their personal relationship deepened along the way, and they wed on March 31, 1976. That same year, they bought a manor home together in Essex, England, living there with their children. In 1980, Susie gave birth to their first child, a daughter named Laura. Four years later, their second child, Richard Leonard, was born. Susie took a break from music for a couple of years to focus on motherhood and spend precious time with her kids. She called this a happy time being a stay-at-home mom. Behind the scenes, however, tensions mounted between Susie and Len, both devoted to music but pulled in different directions by career versus family. Susie largely put performing on hold during this period, while Len was eager to continue playing in bands. By the late 80s, Susie returned to touring and recording, feeling the pull of her lifelong passion for rock music. But re-entering the spotlight exacerbated the strain on her marriage as Len wished she spent more time at home. Despite counseling efforts, the relationship unraveled. After 15 years of marriage, Susie and Len made the difficult decision to divorce in 1992 as musical and family differences drove them apart. They split amicably to maintain civility while co-parenting their two children. The next year, Susie married German concert promoter Rainer Haas, whom she had first met backstage at a 1986 show. Haas lived in Hamburg, Germany, while Susie resided primarily in England, so they often had a long-distance relationship. Susie's divorce and remarriage coincided with her fading record sales and fame. The 90s brought a halt to her professional success and shifted her focus toward live performances overseas, where she retained more popularity. Through ups and downs, her passion for music endured. The divorce took a toll on Susie's son Richard, who was only eight years old at the time. He became rebellious during his teenage years, troubled by his parents splitting up. This caused Susie much stress as a mom. Thankfully, after some difficult years, Richard matured and he and Susie rebuilt their relationship. Susie lamented not getting as much time with her kids once her stardom took off. She tried balancing career and family, but felt she came up short at times in both, a common struggle for famous musicians. Still, she did her best despite inevitable mistakes. By 2006, Susie's daughter Laura and young granddaughter returned to live with her in the Essex Manor home, a happy development. However, Susie revealed she battled empty nest loneliness when they eventually moved out again a couple of years later as the children grew more independent. Susie Quattro experienced the peaks of fame and depths of personal challenges throughout her life's journey. Though not immune to struggles, her dedication to music and family always persevered global touring powerhouse. While Susie Quattro's hit-making heyday faded by the late 1980s, her popularity and relentless touring schedule continued strongly overseas. This was especially true in Europe, Australia, and Japan, where she retained a devoted fan following. After rising to fame in England in 1973, the UK remained a consistent stronghold, even as the 1990s brought a drought in chart success. Britain truly adopted Susie as one of their own. She had hosted popular BBC radio programs centered on rock music during the late 80s as well. Throughout her career, Susie routinely toured across Europe, 
playing festivals and headlining shows from Germany to Spain. In 2010, she performed at massive British festivals like the Isle of Wight, alongside acts like Paul McCartney. Her music resonated across generations. Japan also stayed loyal from her earliest concerts there in 1974 onward. Susie enjoyed a special bond with Japanese fans and returned frequently over the decades for concerts. She was humbled by their steadfast devotion. Australia grew into perhaps Susie's strongest territory besides the UK. Her popularity there exploded in 1976 when she undertook a wildly successful Australia-wide tour that cemented her status. Through the 90s, she continued selling out arenas down under. Touring the world enabled Susie to stay actively doing what she loved most, performing live rock and roll. The crowds and energy kept her feeling youthful and engaged. While not having hit albums, the shows provided creative fulfillment and connection with fans. The touring also afforded Susie financial stability when record sales declined. She was a music industry workhorse, crisscrossing continents annually far into her 60s and 70s when others would have retired. This tireless schedule garnered immense respect. The Enigmatic U.S. Factor One perplexing aspect of Susie Quattro's career is that she never achieved proportionate success or acclaim in her homeland of America compared to abroad. Various factors contributed to this enigmatic U.S. factor. Born in Detroit as rock music exploded, Susie seemed destined for stateside fame. But after local growth with her sister's band, The Pleasure Seekers, she left for England where she had great success. However, American audiences remained elusive despite being the world's largest music market. Early hits like Can the Can made little commercial impact on U.S. charts. Critics also misunderstood or derided her edgy image and bubbly glam rock tunes as manufactured. Susie did gain some visibility by playing Leather Tuscadero on Happy Days, but she declined offers for a spin-off, keeping music first. Sporadic U.S. radio airplay for later singles like Stumblin' In arose, but mainstream fame never materialized at home. Geography and timing likely hindered Susie's chances in America. If she had stayed stateside a bit longer before relocating overseas, perhaps she may have built enough grassroots buzz to launch with U.S. labels and promoters fully behind her. Plus, Susie's glam rock heyday of the early 70s somewhat missed the crest of America's rock wave. She was sandwiched between the psychedelic 60s and punk disco 70s, while Britain embraced glam rock openly. Different cultural tastes hampered connectivity. That said, Susie amassed a devoted American fan base over the years through touring and retains strong Detroit roots. She just never converted that into mass visibility. Rebirth and Recognition later career accolades. After her commercial peak in the 1970s, Susie Quattro's music career quieted down for a while until she regained momentum with a roaring comeback in the 1990s and 2000s. This era brought belated recognition for her pioneering early career and trailblazing female rocker status. The early 90s saw Susie return to releasing new studio albums after a recording hiatus in the late 80s. She aimed to re-establish herself as a viable artist, exploring mature themes. Efforts included the well-received 1992 album Oh Suzy Q and 1993's What Goes Around. Demonstrating longevity, 1998's unreleased emotion compiled unheard songs from earlier in her career alongside new tracks. Proving herself an enduring talent, not just a 70s novelty, became a mission. Energized by playing her first U.S. show in years in 1991, Suzy kept writing and recording. 2006's album Back to the Drive-In marked a full-fledged comeback, hitting number one on Amazon's rock charts, her first chart topper in decades. Mainstream recognition followed with BBC Radio 2, naming Suzy Quattro one of the queens of British pop and producing a 2007 documentary profiling her groundbreaking career. This honored her alongside fellow pioneers like Dusty Springfield. That same year, Suzy published her autobiography Unzipped, taking fans through her rock and roll journey. She also received the honor of being depicted on a postage stamp in the Isle of Man. In 2010, Susie was inducted into the Michigan Rock and Roll Legends Hall of Fame voted by fans. The hometown recognition in Detroit held deep meaning, as did being awarded for musical excellence in Hungary, her mother's homeland. The Godmother of Rock for defiantly breaking ground as a leather-clad female bass-playing rocker in the 1970s, Suzy Quattro earned the moniker the Godmother of Rock for empowering women in music. Her influence on both female musicians and opening doors for women in rock proved monumental. Through her bass skills, commanding stage presence, and edgy outfits, Suzy Quattro challenged preconceived limitations imposed on women in rock music. 
She paved the way for the acceptance of females as more than vocalists, but also instrumentalists and band leaders. Major female artists across eras and genres have cited Susie as a formative inspiration from Joan Jett and Debbie Harry, to Chrissy Hind, Tina Weymouth, KT Tunstall, and Bikini Kill's Kathleen Hanna. She helped engender the female punk wave revolution of the late 70s onwards by normalizing women rocking out. Beyond trailblazing female musicians, Susie was also a role model for generations of ordinary women and girls. She gave fans the courage to pick up guitars and basses themselves and pursue their musical passions without fear of stigma. Her hits like Can the Can and Devil Gate Drive boosted confidence through their messages of inner resolve. Susie's tough bass playing showed that women could hang with male musicians instrumentally. Through her own perseverance in breaking into male-dominated territory, Susie Quattro opened doors for acceptance of leading ladies in rock, from Debbie Harry to Stevie Nicks to Pat Benatar and the Go-Go's in the 80s. Even beyond rock, Susie's bold stage costumes presaged female pop icons like Madonna seizing control of their image. Though from different eras, Susie's spirit of independence carried through. Ironically, because she preceded the major women's liberation movements of the late 20th century, Susie Quattro didn't necessarily self-identify as a feminist trailblazer in her day. She just followed her own path authentically. But in retrospect, her cultural impact as a strong female role model in music was monumental, earning her the fitting godmother of rock moniker. She led by example, letting her bass do the talking. She has proven herself incredibly resilient as well, from surviving industry sexism in the 70s to remaining relevant through cultural shifts. In late 2020, at 70 years old, she even recovered swiftly after contracting COVID-19 through sheer tenacity. Part of Susie's secret is upholding the work ethic instilled growing up in a working-class Detroit family. She views resting on laurels as betraying fans. This blue-collar diligence keeps her focused on the next album, next show, next opportunity. When reflecting on her decades-spanning career, Susie Quattro is most proud that she has always done things on her own terms, never bowing to pressure or outside opinions. This self-determination continues fueling her fire. Rather than a fixation on youth and chart positions like during her hit-making heyday, nowadays Susie prioritizes the art itself, creating new music and connecting with audiences worldwide. She rocks for the sheer love of rock. At an age when most consider retirement, it is this enduring passion for her craft that drives Susie Quattro to just keep going, blazing her pioneering path wherever it takes her. That tenacity cements her icon status. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.